advocates, Frieder Otto Wolf, sitting here at my right side, an outstanding Marxist philosopher, organic intellectual for a social ecological movement since a long time, with a long experience as a politician also, who even reflected on his parliamentary practice. Um, and I don't know which of his numerous and diverse projects I, I, I should mention, maybe the current re-edition of the work of Louis Althusser, um, which was not able to get uh, in Germany uh, in the bookshops anymore. So now we have a new wonderful edition done by Frieda. We had published the call for the conference to this conference on his 70th birthday. Uh, Frieda is a good friend who has been a very close partner to the foundation since many years. So now it's your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, as a philosopher, it is always difficult to speak at this kind of... Hmm? Louder. Louder. So closer to the microphone, probably. Better? No, not really. I have to get really close. Okay. That's okay? Okay. As a philosopher, it is always difficult to speak on matters of substance, because uh, a lot of people know about these matters of substance because A, they are involved in real struggles, B, they are involved in real empirical and theoretical research, and philosophers by profession are not. This is why I would start from uh, what Nancy just uh, ended with, the need to incite a broad range of struggles, not only class struggles, but also what she calls boundary struggles, and try to uh, propose a slightly different way of asking for the theory of the critique of capitalism, which is needed for inciting in this way. And I hope now it works. Yeah. We have a problem here, which is waiting to be addressed. We need the necessary abstraction of theoretical analysis. And this is, as we all know, rather conflictual. And we have, on the other hand, the need to really address the unavoidable complexity of political deliberation, where it is not possible to concentrate on one dimension. And I think Luxembourg's language, in many cases, is an excellent example of this tension. On the one hand, she produces very succinct and clear theoretical models. And on the other hand, when developing the political consequences of this, she turns into a language which at the same time addresses various di dimensions of the problem. Second, modern bourgeois societies under the domination of the capitalist mode of production, and there we begin to diverge, I think are characterized by abstract laws which are the subject matter of Marx's capital. Although uh, the theoretical systematic presentation there has its limits and is, for instance, in the chapter on primitive accumulation, richly uh, underpinned by historical analysis, uh, still, it's about abstract laws of what constitutes capitalist accumulation. And also Luxem Luxembourg uh, tried to address this level. The, capitalist accu the accumulation of capital is an attempt to really address this level of abstract theory. And of course, we have to admit which sometimes within the Marxist tradition has been neglected, that historical reality is far richer 
than these historical, than these models. I think there a lot of confusion has been created by Frederick Engels' historical logical reading of capital, where he sort of uh, saw capital not as a theoretical abstraction, but as a simplified version of real history. And I think we have to overcome this. And Luxembourg did it and did it not, because she, she worked in both directions. So this is the problem I propose to address. And I would start to buy two key quotes, one on epistemology from a letter in, written from prison. In theoretical work as an art, I value only the, the simple, the tranquil and the bold. This is why, for example, the famous first volume of Marx's Capital, with its profuse Rococo ornamentation in the Hegelian style, now seems an abomination to me for, for which, from the party standpoint, I must get five years hard labor and 10 years loss of civil rights. Whereas her own work, based on Marx's economic theories, was in its form extremely simple, without any accessories, without coquetry or optical illusions, straightforward and reduced to the barest essentials. I would even say naked, like a block of marble. So she was very much aware of this necessity of theoretical abstraction. Oops. My second quote concerns capitalist globalization, of which she has been among one of the foremost theoretical thinkers. From the very beginning, the forms and laws of capitalist production aim to comprise the entire globe as a store of productive forces. Capital impelled to appropriate productive hmm? capital impelled to appropriate productive forces for purposes of exploitation, ransacks the whole world. It procures its means of production from all corners of the earth, seizing them, if necessary, by force, from all levels of civilization and from all forms of society. The problem of the material elements of capitalist accumulation, far from being solved by the material form of the surplus value that has been produced, takes on a qu quite a different aspect. It becomes necessary for capital progressively to dispose ever more fully of the whole globe to acquire an unlimited choice of means of production. I think here it is important what has been already stressed, I think, two times, that we are not only talking about geography. We are also talking about dimensions of the social. This could be misunderstood in this quote, but if we look at other places in the text, it's quite clear. Is there a need to talk about historical phases? I think we should, in trying to reappropriate Luxembourg, have an idea that there is a difference between our times and the times of uh, Rosa Luxembourg. But I think at the same time, uh, it is difficult to say, well, this was the time of monopoly capitalism and now we have the time of state monopoly capitalism or whatever. Uh, or the time of neoliberalism, uh, we have to see that the kind of epochal break people were waiting to happen in these times uh, has been obliterated. So we are not in a we are not waiting, I think, for the same kind of epochal break which the October Revolution was ushering in in a couple of years, and the big crisis of the First World War was ushering in on a worldwide and far more extended perspective than just the perspective of Russia. We have to address the problem again of the domination of the capitalist mode of production within real history, and real geography included, and to address, to redefine the question of how, where, and when to break it. Now I should like to go more in detail into the epistemological dimension of what I try to do. Again, 
There's an issue of language. Rosa Luxemburg has underlined that there is a difference between her and her critics in the use of mathematics. Whereas the critics, that's my interpretation, are in many cases uh, taking up the kind of new language of the economy which has been de developed by the neoclassics. She is limiting the use of mathematical models to the exemplification and clarification of points that can also be made clear in simple discourse. And I think that's a, a very important distinction, uh, which has often been overlooked in the economic debate on Luxembourg. So it is clear that a clear theoretical language is needed, but the kind of formalization the neoclassics have brought are not to be accepted as the necessary way of generating a clear language. And I think there are good arguments to say that the kind of model building that has been developing throughout the social sciences on this model is to be criticized and rejected. And in this way, uh, we can sort of make far clearer than she herself was able to do the distinction between the approach she was pursuing and the, the approach of her colleagues. And then the big point is uh, the point of view of reproduction, which she has uh, very uh, intensively embraced. Uh, in accumulation, she underlined that Karl Marx made a contribution of lasting service to the theory of economics when he drew attention to the problem of the reproduction of the entire social capital. According to her, in the beginnings of modern classical political economy, this had been introduced by Kene, and then it had been neglected, and it was Marx who had taken up the problem again, and she is taking up the problem. Um, I'm not going to read all the long paragraphs which I selected here because I see I will have a problem of time. But uh, I think there is a very important point in her analysis of reproduction, which is still valid, that there is a sort of general aspect to the point of view of reproduction. But at the same time, and I think there it would be very interesting to sort of reread and rediscuss what you said, capitalism has changed the very structures of reproduction. So within capitalism, the problem of reproduction is posed in a quite dis different and distinct way from traditional societies. And I think this is a, an important point. Um, and within the capitalist society, she, says, she sums up the problem from the point of view of reproduction within the capitalist society, the question is, how is it possible that the unplanned plans supply the market for labor and means of production, and the unplanned and incalculable changes in demand nevertheless provide adequate quantities and qualities of means of production, labored opportunities for selling, which the individual capitalist needs in order to make a sale? How can it be assured that every one of these factors increases in the right proportion. And here I would like to make a comment on her critique of the second volume of Capital. Because I think she's right. The second volume of Capital is not on the same level as the first volume. There are serious flaws. Especially what is left out entirely there is the reproduction of the force of labor. So the, the labor power, the reproduction of labor power is not a part of the uh, reconstruction of the forms of reproduction, which is the object of the second volume. And I think this is a major problem. Um, but 
I would not agree with the Luxembourg that the kind of abstraction Marx is making here, where he analyzes how the capitalist mode of production as such in abstraction and therefore in isolation is capable of organizing its own reproduction. This is, I think, a not only legitimate but necessary question which has to be addressed. Which does not mean, and this is often confused, that what is done in volume two is to be applied immediately in any given society. Because it is if based on some really strong abstractions which have to be lifted before addressing any specific, concrete, given society. Okay. Well, I would like to, I would not go into the details of the reproduction problem here. Uh, I would add a third point here, the domination of the capitalist mode of production within real history. If it is true, as I think it is, and I think also the accumulation of capital is aware of, that the abstract structure of capitalist reproduction and domination is in fact very abstract and has to be supplemented by knowledge of concrete constellations and structures existing in specific concrete societies, then we have a problem of, of the ideal average. There is a conceptual problem of the ideal average which Marx has never fully lifted because it is in fact two different determinations. Idealizing is not the same thing as constructing an average. And uh, I think in Marx it is indicative of a problem which he saw was, but was unable to solve. To, to solve. I quote the first uh, sentence of volume one of Capital here with a slight modification of the current English translation. Uh, the wealth of societies in which I underline the capitalist mode of production as it is in the English text, as in the French text, but it is not in the German text. In the German text, it's without the definite article, which I do not think really makes a difference, but could make a difference. So if we have to address this, we have to be aware that this idea of the capitalist mode of production, which can be constructed theoretically in abstract terms, is central to Marx's enterprise and is not, and I think there the first phrase is already very clear, not to be taken as a kind of uh, shortened version of the analysis of concrete capitalist societies. The wealth of societies, this is a plural in which the capitalist mode of production singular dominates, and that's the problem. How one ideal uh, average kind of mode of production can dominate in different societies. I think that's the problem to be addressed. Uh, <clears throat> in the anti-critique, uh, I think Luxembourg has taken up this problem. He says, Marx's assumption is only a theoretical premise in order to simplify investigation. Well, you could, there's this certain epistemological pragmatism about this formulation which could be debatable. But I don't think, do not think this is really the point uh, to pursue here. In reality, that is in real societies, plural, capitalist production is not the sole and completely dominant form of production as everyone knows. And I think this is undeniable. Marxists who have tried to deny this have not understood the character of Marx's critique of political economy. And therefore, uh, 
if we analyze specific societies, we have to analyze the problem of the articulation of modes of production. We have to analyze how the capitalist mode of production, in fact, dominates in rather different societies where all these divisions you have been referring to are organized and determined in different ways. And from here she, uh, in the anti-critique again, she argues why she had to go beyond Marx's capital. The theoretical assumption of a society of capitalists and workers only, which is legitimate for certain aims of investigation, as in the first volume of Capital, no longer seems adequate when we deal with the accumulation of gross social capital. And I think she has a point there, but she is sort of precipitating things because the problematic of the second and the third volume are still problematics of capital in general or capital in its ideal average. They are not analysis of concrete specific societies. And I think this is very important because this is where Luxembourg is sort of making, a, I would say, a category mistake in thinking that in having the analysis of competing capitals, we already have the analysis of what happens in a given society in which the capitalist mode of production dominates. And I think this is false. And therefore, uh, it is correct what she says, that in analyzing concrete societies, we have to go beyond capital, that is the theoretical reconstruction of Marx, even if we can complete it, which is, as it is, incomplete. But uh, this is not an argument to sort of break the development of Marx's theoretical categories after volume one, volume two and volume three, are legitimate and important objects of analysis which have to be done in an abstract way uh, with leaving the necessary leeway for addressing the specifics of concretely given historical societies where in fact we have not only the capitalist economy, we have uh, the remnants of older, society, of older modes of production, but we also have what I would define as the modernized forms of gender relations, patriarchal relations, uh, nature, uh, eco uh, economy relations, international relations, dependency relations, etc., which are not the same. It's not true that the relations in the household today are remnants of the medieval household. This, I think, is insufficient. The dominance of the capitalist mode of production means that it has also transformed the very structures uh, it is depending on. So in many ways, I think we, we come to, different, to, to similar observations, although we use a different theoretical language. Now I would very briefly uh, also uh, develop some ideas on the accumulation of capital as a basis for politics. One, how to translate this kind of uh, theoretical analysis, which is very abstract indeed, uh, in spite of the claim of Luxembourg to say, well, this is uh, addressing directly what is happening in imperialist societies. One is the problem of what is the whole? What is the totality? How is the totality constructed and totalized? And which are the exceptions to the totality? In which way, within the very totality, as you said, internal contradiction is important. And this is something which has to be developed before political conclusions can be drawn. You cannot draw political conclusions on something like the 
tendency of the rate of profit to fall or uh, the tendency for the centralization of capital or for the expansion of wage labor. These as such, important as they are as historical tendencies, are not a starting point for politics. Politics have to start from the entirety of a, political, of a given situation in a given society, and this makes it difficult to use just one aspect of general theory as a basis, and I think a lot of Marxist politics uh, has been uh, suffering from this problem. Uh, this could be uh, exemplified by looking at the relation between the accumulation of capital and Luxembourg's political writings, where it could also be exemplified already uh, by looking at the relation between Marx's capital and Marx's political writings, which are from different worlds, really. Uh, but I think this is something to be done. I simply refer to this here abstract. Then there is the problem of economic uh, reductionism leveled against Luxembourg, there are already you, and you have said something, I think, which I share. The accumulation of capital is central in many ways, but not necessarily always determining the concrete outcome in a concrete situation. So uh, the centrality of uh, the accumulation of capital uh, does not imply that the only source of knowledge on which to base political initiatives and action uh, is to be found there. And I think this could be translated by saying that laws of development, about which also Luxembourg talks, and I think quite rightfully, uh, have to be seen as the ground, that is the explanation, for uh, the assumption of tendencies and real trends existing within specific historical processes. Although this is again the problem of determining how the capitalist mode of production dominates, how these tendencies effectively do shape real events. There is the problem of the capitalist mode of production and its domination, and this is also a problem of the relation between the countries or states within which capitalism has been fully developed and others where capitalism is just beginning. Often this is not just a problem between countries but also between different spheres of society. And there I think the modern state and the form of international politics are extremely important and there you could make an argument that Luxembourg, in the accumulation of capital at least, is sort of just looking at the, at the basic economic mechanism and not at the kind of uh, guarantees and uh, military and political uh, shaping which the modern states supply in this respect. And I think in this context, imperialism has to be analyzed as a politically mediated form of domination, which uh, in fact tries to solve problems of capital accumulation, but uh, which is not just a mere epiphenomenon of the contradictions of capital accumulation itself. Well, I would like to just begin to come to a conclusion. If we look back at Luxembourg's contribution in this light, which I tried to sketch, we can see that there is a, has been a lot of denial and repression exercised with regard to her. The idea of historical automatism has already been quoted, uh, is not really applying to her. The idea of spontaneism that nothing should be done or everything will happen is certainly not hers and her anti-Leninism is extremely relative. 
I think it, there is a useful debate whether what she was criticizing in Lenin was not exactly what should be criticized in Lenin. So there is a necessity of uh, uh, defending her against this uh, criticism of anti-Leninism in the name of the needed critiques. And uh, Lenin himself was not always of one mind, and uh, there's a lot of Lenin's self-criticism, so this should be part of the debate, and certainly Lux Luxembourg has something important to say here. I think trying to gorge Luxembourg's possible actual today's role, we could see that, in a way, she's an impossible role model for us. The kind of unity of theory and practice she has been uh, incorporating is nothing we can try to replicate. The indistinction of philosophy, science, and rhetoric in her, which I think is extremely sympath symp sympathetical, uh, is certainly not something we should try to emulate. Our uh, uh, task as intellectuals is rather to make it clear which dimension, which uh, resources we are using and how far this can carry us. So the mirage of the historical personality is certainly something to be romantic, romantic about, but not anything we can try to emulate. Historical personalities will emerge. I think that's certainly something we can expect, but they are of all sorts. And uh, if we look at historical personalities more specifically, we shall find that in them there is an enormous and complex overdetermination of very different aspects, and each historical personality is different from the other. So it is not a, a historical mo or a role model to try to be a historical personality. I think a new perspective to be gained in making use of what Luxembourg in many ways has started is looking at the challenges of a needed structural transformation in a polycentric constellation of domination. We do not just have one domination to deal with, we have a number of structures of domination to deal with, although they are hierarchical and one is using the others more effectively than the others are using it. Still, uh, we have to address the various struggles and the various structures in their specific light. And in many ways, the political writings of Luxembourg provide examples of how to do this. I think there is practically three, there are practically three conclusions the accumulation of capital in a global perspective today is an important research perspective. The idea of primary politics as a politics of resistance and liberation, which is very vivid in her political writings, is a political perspective to be gained from reactualizing and re-encountering Luxembourg. And third, which is, which is still the most important and difficult thing, we have to rediscover the ways and paradoxes of organizing struggles of liberation, which is, as we all know, not something easily to be conceived, let alone done. And there I stop. Yeah.